Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We are live on the first day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. Remember, we're streaming on YouTube Live too. Well, we have today the honor of having Dr. L. Dade Lunsford. Dr. Lunsford is a well-known neurosurgeon from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is the Lars Lexell and distinguished professor from University of Pittsburgh, director of the Center for Image-Guided Neurosurgery, resident director and chair from the Technology and Innovative Practice Committee. Now at the IWBNC, Dr. Lunsford is going to share his lecture, Brain Metastasis Radiosurgery, Surgery, a game changer for neurosurgeons and oncologists. Please type your questions in the Q&A section. We will read them after the end of Dr. Lunsford's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Lunsford, and thank you. It is all yours. Thank you very much. I am uh, delighted to be asked to be uh, part of this outstanding uh, technological, I'm sure, triumph, um, because um, this is uh, the future, I believe, of a lot of what neurosurgery education um, may become. We are all uh, affected by the pandemic on a worldwide basis, and uh, this is also a game changer, I believe. I am uh, grateful uh, to uh, Professor Riveros um, and to the Center for Research and Training in Neurosurgery for inviting me uh, to give this talk. So uh, what I proposed as a uh, topic uh, was something which in fact uh, is one of the most common problems that we as neurosurgeons and oncologists deal with, and that is uh, when cancer spreads to the brain. And um, at least in the United States, we can estimate uh, that there'll be 300,000 new cases uh, this year and a population of, let's say, 350 million. Uh, new uh, metastases that spread to the brain in which we as neurosurgeons uh, have the opportunity to be major players. In the past, we generally looked upon our role as doing the occasional craniotomy for a patient uh, who had a big tumor that needed decompression or to get a diagnosis of a uh, tumor that uh, showed up in the brain for which we had no known primary. But what I hope to show you over today is that what now is the proper management of many patients uh, does not always include uh, craniotomy. And in fact, what it does is significantly increase the role which we as surgeons and oncologists uh, can uh, provide to our patients because compared to prior years when uh, our only option was surgery and when probably 80% of our patients died of progression of their cancer in the brain, that is totally flipped at the present time where most patients die if their disease systemically is out of control. Uh, I would like to tell you about two complex of interest. I am a uh, sh uh, shareholder and elect of the maker of the Gamma Knife, and I currently serve uh, as one of the international members of the Data Safety and Monitoring Board for Inside Tech, which is uh, a company which make is, makes Focus Ultrasound another innovative technology. But what are our goals in the management of cancer when it spreads to the brain? First of all, we want to be able to preserve or even improve function of the patient. We want to avoid delaying the treatment of their systemic disease uh, by having a procedure which is effective, uh, cost effective, um, and does allow the oncologist to proceed with systemic treatment without interruption. Obviously, to do that, we want to improve both overall survival and progression-free survival of the patient. Many patients, at least initially on diagnosis, will be placed on corticosteroids uh, for edema. Um, but this is not optimal in the world of molecular uh, management of these uh, types of tumors. Uh, and we want to get them off steroids, especially if they're going to go into immunotherapy. We clearly want to minimize uh, side effects, just as we do with any conventional management of a problem in the brain. And then we want to be able to provide cost-effective uh, uh, care. So there are a number of current issues and maybe during this talk, we'll help to answer a few of them. Which patients should have a craniotomy? Well, in our view, it's those patients in which a diligent search shows no known primary and you suspect a metastasis. 
there are some patients who present with very large tumors and those patients with extensive edema and mass effect may in fact benefit from initial craniotomy as the management. But as we'll see, it may be possible actually to combine both radiosurgery uh, followed by craniotomy as a means to reduce secondary side effects such as delayed recurrence of the uh, tumor or carcinomatous meningitis. So which patients would we now consider uh, for the alternative usual strategy, which many oncologists immediately embark on, that is whole brain radiation therapy. And we reserve that for the management of patients with clear-cut carcinomatous meningitis and patients with miliary disease, that is multiple, multiple uh, small brain metastasis spread throughout the neuraxis. We used to think that radiosurgery, when it first began, is perhaps an alternative to traditional craniotomy. Well, it could be used for one, and then as time and data showed up, as I'll show you, it became obvious that it could be used for two, or five, or 10, 20. Really, as we'll talk about, the number of tumors is not relevant to the decision-making process. Radius surgery results in DNA injury to the cells. It results in eventually uh, turning them into apoptotic cells that die. It does this through a direct cell kill and DNA damage. It also does this through a secondary release of uh, vasoactive cytokine uh, substances, and subsequently uh, also endothelial proliferation uh, leading to blood vessel uh, narrowing, just as we see in the management of arteriovenous malformations. So we now know that over the last 20 years, especially, there has been a body of evidence, currently more than 6,000 publications and multiple revised guidelines that support the use of radiosurgery, not just as an alternative and not just as a salvage management, but often as a primary management for the patient who first presents with newly diagnosed uh, metastatic disease or patients who have developed recurrent or new tumors in the brain after prior uh, treatment. This has be really begun uh, more than 25 years ago in the exploration of the usage of radiosurgery. Um, and of course, most of the initial data was uh, um, single centers reporting their initial experience. And this stimulated interest, of course, to perform prospective uh, randomized uh, trials comparison of the usual uh, standard whole head radiation therapy uh, and uh, that compared to either using radiosurgery alone or in combination with uh, uh, whole brain. And what was found in these studies, including this from Japan, was that median survival between patients who had radiosurgery alone, those who had that plus radiation therapy was not statistically different. Neither was the one year survival uh, or uh, the difference mainly was found in the risk of new late development of additional tumors. So this stimulated some to think, well, that means we shouldn't abandon whole brain, we should just add it. But the reality is that, as we'll see, what is the management of new disease? Uh, the new disease management is repeat radiosurgery. So guidelines developed based on the strength of the uh, data that was um, available over the course of time using the high level evidence, uh, suggesting that one uh, um, is a very important, the addition of both radiosurgery and whole brain was important, but in the end, significant evidence has now emerged that radiosurgery alone without the need for whole brain radiation therapy may be um, the standard of care that's now emerged. So if we look at this case from 1995, we now see, just as you have no doubt seen in your own practice, that what used to be thought of as the kiss of death, that is a brain spread of the cancer, is now something that is quickly and efficiently treated by radiosurgery. And as long as you can control systemic disease, especially with the development of new uh, potent uh, systemic treatments, we have patients who are long-term survivors of what used to be thought of as a fatal complication of cancer, as seen in this patient 16 years after the initial management of their brain metastasis in the cerebellum. 
So over our 32-year uh, experience uh, using uh, radiosurgery here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, certainly the largest indication for radiosurgery is related to uh, metastatic brain cancer. Number one is lung, where it's uh, almost 3,000 patients, and next, uh, breast cancer, almost 1,200. Melanoma, despite the fact we don't see very much sunshine in Pittsburgh compared to, let's say, uh, South America, um, over 900 patients uh, with melanoma, renal, and a whole variety of less common types of uh, uh, cancers. Uh, so the spectrum of use is not dependent upon the histology of origin, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the results. So in the prior years, we might think that this patient seen here with a motor strip brain metastasis with contralateral hemiparesis may best be managed by surgical removal. But in fact, this patient underwent a radiosurgery and you see a very uh, conformal plan in a single treatment done in a single day in a single morning, this procedure wheels in to wheels out, takes about three hours, uh, much faster than we can even set up and do a, a craniotomy in, in many uh, places. And this patient, one year after follow-up, looks pristine. There is no evidence of remaining tumor, and that includes both contrast-enhanced scan seen on the left and long TR imaging seen on the right. The white matter looks normal, the gyral sulcal pattern looks normal, and there's no tumor and no new tumors are seen. Now, what about this patient? This is a patient uh, who has known lung cancer and presents with this uh, symptomatic mass in the right frontal lobe associated with significant uh, um, swelling or edema. She's 52 years of age. We want to be aggressive in the management of this problem. So this patient has radiosurgery, not a craniotomy. And this is 10 months later after the procedure with the no evidence of residual tumor. But of course, we need to follow these patients. And our general protocol is uh, MRI scans at three month intervals uh, in the first year and no new disease, then we can switch maybe to every six months in patients who have no new symptoms. However, what happened in this patient was about six months later, she again has a follow-up MRI scan. The frontal tumor is gone, but now she's got a new tumor in the temporal lobe, also moderately large. Again, no craniotomy, gamma knife, radiosurgery, six months later, no evidence of tumor, no new tumors. The patient continues on with systemic treatment uh, of their primary lung cancer uh, uh, using targeted therapy. So the patient's systemically doing well, brain is doing well. Here she is four years later after this, we can see a mi minor footprint in the frontal lobe tumor, a minor footprint in the right temporal lobe tumor, left temporal lobe tumor, um, but otherwise, she's completely functional, normal neurological examination. Now, how fast can radiosurgery actually work? So as a general concept, our protocol is simply to repeat the first post-treatment scan in about three months. But occasionally, you have a patient who, for other reasons, needs an interval scan. And in this particular situation, we can see this uh, tumor invading the falcs uh, here from the motor strip uh, going through the falcs who for other reasons ended up with a scan as part of her staging of the uh, cancer. We actually see that the overall C uh, CT scan picture shows a tumor that's significantly smaller at two, four, and four weeks, and actually at six weeks. So what does this mean? If this patient is symptomatic at the time of the procedure, this patient will usually be on corticosteroids, but it allows us to taper them off of that. Uh, usually within two to four weeks, we can get them completely off of uh, any type of steroid medication. Now, um, survivals depend on the primary uh, lesion um, as well as the extent of the systemic disease. And if we look at these patients' uh, total survival, regardless of the total <clears throat> number of brain metastases, uh, we can see varying tumor control rates, but all in the range of 90% or higher related to the treatment and outcomes of their metastatic disease, even for those tumors which we think of as perhaps more radiation resistance, such as sarcomas, uh, uh, renal cell cancers, and uh, gastrointestinal uh, types of uh, cancers and melanoma. Um, so what also changed in the paradigm over these years is that there were cases which we, of course, were referred to in older days of a solitary lesion, but in a very delicate part of the brain, as in this patient, 
probe with a metastatic uh, tumor in the brainstem. The management of this patient is not whole brain radiation therapy. The management of this patient is radiosurgery, single procedure, even for a deep-seated uh, tumor. Um, and what we see over the course of time in these patients is an excellent response. This really changes not only what we should do, it changes what we can do. And it keeps us as neurosurgical oncologists involved in the management of cancer, which as I said, is the most common uh, thing that we see uh, as an indication uh, for, uh, for radiosurgery. So this patient who were in initially presented with a facial neuropathy uh, with endometrial cancer, six weeks after the procedure shows complete resolution, cranial nerve deficits, as well as a dramatic shrinkage of the, uh, of the tumor. So then the question began, if this works for a patient with one tumor, why should it not be able to be tried for a patient with multiple tumors? Again, most of the time in the years past, when this patient was diagnosed either by CT or MRI scan by either the uh, primary physician or by an oncologist, this patient was found on multiple tumors, immediately would be sent for whole brain radiation therapy. Neurosurgeon oncologists is not even involved in the management uh, of this type of patient. The patient goes directly bypass uh, to uh, have whole brain uh, radiation therapy. But this patient is an excellent candidate uh, with six lesions for treatment of uh, these multiple brain metastases, many of which are in pretty important locations, brainstem, medulla, and then um, the thalamus, uh, for example. So why should we continue to abandon the reflex usage of whole brain radiation therapy? First of all, we know that it's associated over time with significant neurocognitive decline, which is related to the biological uh, sensitivity of oligodendroglia, which nourish our white matter, um, to ionizing radiation. Oligodendroglia are, in fact, the most radiation-sensitive cells within the brain. Finally, um, or not finally, but also it's because it's actually less effective in terms of tumor response to radiosurgery. Radiosurgery has a much better likelihood of actual tumor shrinkage. And generally, in most centers, uh, um, whole brain radiation therapy is done over the course of 10 to 12 treatments with daily treatment for the patient to come in, whereas radiosurgery is typically done in a single treatment, wheels in to wheels out in a single day. So it allows us to, again, keep this in reserve for other problems. If we treat a patient initially with whole brain, and later they develop widespread leptomeningeal carcinoma, then we've sort of lost that tool to which we can apply at a more appropriate time, or in the case of patient who develops 40, 50, or 60 brain nets. So a variety of studies have been over time, which confirm that radiosurgery is much more likely to preserve not only white matter, but the important aspect of neurocognitive function. These patients can still uh, do a checkbook. They can still drive. Um, they don't have the cognitive decline that we see in uh, patients who have undergone whole brain radiation therapy. And various studies have shown that this can be tested and found as early as several months after the whole brain radiation uh, therapy. And it, it gets worse over the, uh, over the months uh, uh, and in long-term survivor over the years. So here's a quiz. Uh, there are two patients uh, here. Uh, patient one had uh, a radius surgery or a brain metastasis, um, and uh, our patient two, rather, had uh, radius surgery. Patient one had whole brain radiation therapy. And what we see is a gradually worsening of leukodystrophy, uh, and leuko uh, white matter changes um, in that the patient who has had whole brain, that is patient one, um, and the patients who had radius surgery, we don't see that. So it develops over the course of time. It can actually be graded. Uh, um, a normal brain is seen on the left. The middle uh, 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 brain in the picture shows uh, beginning uh, periventricular white matter changes, uh, which over the course of time, uh, especially by one year, uh, is in a, a grade three level with widespread uh, white matter uh, changes. And if we look at the, this, uh, um, how often do we see this? Even in patients who are on uh, chemotherapy, uh, most patients have relatively normal white matter uh, prior to uh, intervention. 
But by the time the second follow-up occurs, it's uh, uh, say uh, nine months or to a year, uh, grade three changes are seen in almost all of the patients uh, who have whole brain radiation therapy. So it's also important to remember that if the patient has had whole brain radiation therapy, it's really only treating disease present at the time of treatment over those 10 days. It's certainly not preventing new disease development. New disease comes from either unrecognized disease because of the quality of the MRI that was done to stage the patient to begin with and something was missed, or it comes from the fact that new disease repopulates the brain uh, coming from the original systemic choice. So we reserve, the, again, uh, the role of whole brain for these uh, indications, widespread disease and carcinomatous meningitis. Well, what is the uh, number of cases or the limit that we can use uh, for radiation? Uh, this is a patient with multiple brain tumors. Makes you think, well, maybe whole brain, but no, we can do this patient uh, with the radiosurgery. Uh, because this is the patient that we're going to do a whole brain radiation therapy for multiple leptomeningeal deposits of their, uh, of their cancer. Um, so uh, various professional organizations over the course of time uh, have begun to look at this in, in more detail. And then in fact, uh, publications have uh, uh, emerged, which indicates that the role of whole brain radiation therapy is and should decline over the course of time especially if you're young um, and uh, have cancer uh, to hold off on that. And that's been part of the uh, recent information going out to many radiation oncologists to don't routinely add whole brain radiation therapy to radiosurgery for brain metastasis. So in this particular example, we have a solitary tumor in a 65-year-old man with non-small cell lung cancer. This patient is treated with a, a radiation dose which gives at the margin of this tumor, 20 gray. The overall volume of the brain and the tumor surrounding it, and we look at the 12 gray volume because that helps us to predict risk and the risk of a problem developing is 1.7 cc's. Here is a patient with two tumors, uh, colorectal cancer. This tumor is small in the cerebellum, but there's this large right parietal tumor, which in fact is nine cc's. We treat slightly different doses, perhaps a little bit reduced dose at the margin of this. And one of the things that's emerging, which is interesting is, we used to think that the margin uh, of the uh, treatment dose was the most important thing. But I think we have more and more evidence that it's actually the percent of the tumor that's getting greater than 20 gray that may be the most important part of predicting control of the tumor. If we look at this combination of the 12 gray volume, that is the tumor and the surrounding brain outside of the tumor getting at least 12 gray, it's a pretty large volume, 25 uh, cc's. Now, that means if you have a three centimeter tumor uh, that's 13 cc's in size compared to a one centimeter tumor where the volume is quite small, it really, this single tumor, and actually in the United States, there is a lot of reimbursement coding aspects that says, well, we'll you can treat a single tumor, but if the patient has 26 tumors, you can't treat that patient because uh, the patient should have whole brain. But the reality is the volume of that single tumor is not much different than the volume of a patient who's got 26 tumors that are only one centimeter in size. So in a 61-year-old female with breast cancer and six to seven small lesions known on the basis of the prior scan, on the day of the procedure, we do a high definition scan with a stereotactic guiding device on the head. And unfortunately, what we find is a few surprises in about 30% of patients, that is higher quality imaging will often detect more than what we thought on the basis of the scan sent to us at the time of referral. So these patients, the total tumor volume is still 2.7 cc's. Each tumor is going to get a minimum dose of 16 gray. The 12 gray volume is relatively low. And we're going to treat all of these uh, uh, tumors rather than whole brain radiation therapy because we want to preserve the patient's neurocognitive uh, function and be the efficient uh, treatment over the course of time. Uh, we recently published this month a study in the Journal of Neurosurgery looking at patients who had tumors in the range of uh, more than 15 brain metastases. Um, and if we look at the median dose to the total brain, that is if you treat the, the, all these tumors, 20 tumors in the patient's head, 
the average dose to all the white matter and gray matter of the brain is only 2.5 gray. That means that's a single whole brain radiation dose. All done in one day, it's not going to get 10 more treatments. It's only going to get this single treatment. So in our uh, paradigm uh, um, at the Center for Interventional Neurosurgery here at UPMC, um, surely if the patient has a big tumor symptomatic mass effect, no known primary, this patient uh, may go to directly to resection, although we're going to talk a little bit about maybe doing pre-resection radiosurgery to prevent um, the development of recurrence, but also to reduce the risk of carcinomatous meningitis related to tumor resection. And then we can look at tumor volumes, uh, but uh, we say use a total tumor volume of 25 cc's of arm stereotactic radiosurgery. We treat this patient in a couple of hours in a single uh, treatment. Now, if this patient has, let's say, 30 brain metastases or has whole brain, maybe we'll do radiosurgery. Maybe we'll even divide it into two to five sessions with radiosurgery and only have the whole brain patient in the miliary leptomeningeal disease group. This began with data starting uh, almost 20 years ago uh, from our center looking at 205 patients and looking at factors that affect outcomes. So it's not the tumor volume in the brain. It's the patient's performance status, which is extremely important in predicting survival. Age is very important. The number of extracranial metastases that is in the lung, liver, or, um, or bone and is the tumor uh, controlled primary. Those are the important things. And these patients in class one um, uh, RPA uh, will have the highest chance of long-term survival in this group of patients, median survival of over 18 months. On the other hand, in the patients who have poor performance status often result to end-stage cancer or perhaps uh, tumors uh, resulting in hemiparesis, um, then maybe only three months of survival. So we do this uh, in more patients. This was up to 10 or 15 patients in this publication. And then uh, uh, Dr. Yamamoto and Jet Pan put together a, a case match propensity study looking at this. And it didn't matter whether there were more than four METs uh, or less than four METs, neurological death recurrence, need for repeat radiosurgery, neurological worsening or complication. There was no difference in this uh, one to four METs or those who had more than uh, five. Similarly, in this report from Korea, again, showing that this is a widespread uh, game changer across many cultures and, and uh, medical communities. Uh, it's not the volume uh, of the, it's not the number of METs, it's the volume of the METs that's important in terms of looking at uh, overall median uh, survival. So the most important finding in terms of predicting survival in patients is not number or volume of METs in the brain, it's related to the primary tumor status uh, um, and the number of extracranial diseases and their performance score that helps to predict uh, survival, especially in today's targeted era uh, when both many lung cancers, breast cancers, renal cancers are all uh, in melanoma are all suitable for a specific targeted treatment, we can expect increasing survival. Um, and we have to be able to have uh, techniques in neurosurgery uh, to, uh, to help that along. Um, so again, we found similar uh, survivals, uh, um, but much better survivals in breast uh, and lung um, and uh, melanoma, uh, even though we have very large number of patients in the median number of tubers in the breast cancer patients was 23 in the melanoma, 21 uh, all treated on the same day with, with radiosurgery. So that's what the literature now shows, that it's similar effectiveness uh, uh, for multiple brain metastases. Um, that's led to others who've, uh, again, supported the concept uh, that we need to limit the use of whole brain radiation therapy. Um, despite uh, um, this, radiosurgery will be associated with new tumor development, and then we do repeat radiosurgery. So over the course of years, we have patients who have two, three, four, or five procedures. Whole brain radiation therapy salvage was only needed in, in this series in New York, 20% of patients, but only 12% of patients died, died from progression of intracranial disease. Um, so what about subgroups of patients, ones which, for example, have often had reflex upfront 
uh, radiation therapy, uh, on, in this case, small cell lung cancer that spreads to the brain. So uh, in many uh, environments, uh, these patients all get, of course, aggressive chemotherapy, but the concept that their brain was a uh, sponge that would be a site for residual disease, not uh, um, responsive to chemotherapy, we're told you need to get prophylactic cranial radiation, usually doses of two to 3,000, like whole brain radiation therapy, delivered over the course of uh, time. But data has also continued to emerge in this subgroup of patients of small cell lung cancer that other options uh, exist, especially radiosurgery. Um, and so what this uh, study uh, found uh, in the Japan was that this uh, usage of prophylactic craniation, cranial radiation did not result in overall longer survivor in these patients. So that means that the reflex usage of this um, uh, in patients is not uh, always uh, necessary and survival may not always benefit from uh, this, at least in the case of small cell uh, lung cancer. Um, so we uh, published uh, um, a year ago uh, a study of 90 patients of uh, whom 30 had uh, prophylactic cranial radiation. Um, and what we found is that uh, local tumor control was found at 85%, meaning that the tumors that were treated responded, but some patients may have recurrent disease and need to repeat or salvage radiosurgery in the future. But we found no difference in the survival in the patients who had, up, uh, had, had upfront uh, radiation uh, compared to those who had radiosurgery uh, alone. Uh, there was no better or improvement in the uh, tumor control. But what about the ones with symptomatic mass effect that come into you, see you, uh, and uh, we look at this very large tumor and uh, we say, well, I've got to take it out. Well, some of these are in fact cystic uh, tumors, especially as we see in a certain lung um, or other uh, uh, glandular cancers, adenocarcinomas of uh, various origins. Uh, sometimes we've stereotactically aspirated the uh, cyst to collapse the uh, tumor and then followed it by uh, radiosurgery, even done on the, uh, on the same day. Now, for some of the larger tumors in which you think that the rate at which the tumor is going to shrink in a patient who's symptomatic uh, may be too slow, um, and so you do surgery first. But one thing to think about is that um, it may be possible to do, especially in patients who are at high risk um, uh, for um, a surgery, patients who are on blood thinners, patients who have other major medical morbidities, um, we can do uh, procedures in which we treat the tumor, uh, in this case in the cerebellum, and then we wait and we redose the patient with a re repeat procedure uh, in about one week leading to more rapid and more effective uh, um, uh, shrinkage of the uh, tumor. Uh, this has been termed by some centers adaptive uh, radiosurgery. Uh, here's a similar patient with this uh, very badly located uh, metastatic uh, um, renal uh, carcinoma in the dorsal aspect of the brainstem uh, about 10 weeks after uh, adaptive uh, radiosurgery with major uh, shrinkage. Uh, here's a patient who presented uh, with an unknown uh, primary uh, with a metastatic uh, tumor in the uh, brainstem. He actually had a stereotactic biopsy, which confirmed that it was melanoma. He then the same day underwent uh, um, radiosurgery, the same day as the biopsy, um, because we could see that well on the uh, biopsy uh, uh, initial uh, look, um, and underwent radiosurgery. Um, he did have hydrocephalus, uh, and we felt that that needed treatment relatively soon, so he had a shunt done, um, and then uh, uh, radiosurgery. But there were still problems with imbalance and coordination in one month, so due to continued treatments uh, or symptoms, we retreated the patient early in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the game. So here it is at the time of radiosurgery, two and a half months, five and a half months, and eight and a half months after the treatment of this uh, uh, ponto mesencephalic tumor. This patient is now alive four and a half years later uh, with metastatic uh, melanoma. So another concept has emerged as the role of radiosurgery, uh, which we mentioned, which is that in patients who uh, you think need to have resection, um, we may be able to reduce the risk of recurrence of the tumor as well as the risks of a delayed carcinomatous meningitis, uh, which is unfortunately higher in the patients who undergo surgical removal. 
And so treating the patient up front, treat the tumor with radiosurgery, and then follow that the next day or two days later with craniotomy and surgical uh, resection of this. And what we can see is in the patients who had both, um, the risk of carcinoma uh, meningitis is significantly less in the patients who had upfront radiosurgery compared to those who had salvaged radiosurgery after the uh, recovery from the uh, craniotomy. Over the uh, years, uh, various cost-effective uh, studies have uh, been done, which clearly demonstrate that compared to either surgery or actually to whole brain radiation therapy, uh, radiosurgery is a much more cost-effective uh, um, strategy in the management of these problems and allows the patients to continue on with their systemic treatment without uh, inter interruption. So in this study uh, from uh, um, uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, and looking at the quality adjusted uh, life years, the patients who had the gamma knife uh, the quality adjusted life years of 10,000 compared to those with whole brain radiation therapy, uh, 17,000 in, in, uh, in US uh, dollars. But beyond the dollars aspect of it, uh, radiosurgery led to better quality uh, uh, of life in, 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 these, uh, in these patients. Now, sometimes it's hard to know after you've treated the patient three months, six months later, if some of the changes that you see, which aren't always dramatic shrinkage, is a reactive change around the size of the original lesion. So is this radiation of injury or is this related to tumor progression? We tend to use a combination of long tier imaging T1 and T2, which every patient gets, and look for a, uh, a correlation uh, between them. And when they correlate, there's about a 90% chance that we can determine or dis uh, distinguish radiation effect versus uh, tumor uh, um, tumor progression. If we do see suspected uh, radiation uh, injury, uh, we put briefly a patient on corticosteroids, but because of the side effects, especially in patients getting targeted therapy, we don't want to keep this for very long. So we try it and taper them off after three weeks. We then switch them to a combination of vitamin E and uh, pentoxyphylline or trental 400 milligrams twice a day for 90 days. Um, in more severe cases in which persistent edema uh, develops, uh, uh, using bevacizumab uh, or Avastin allows us to be able to get the patients rapidly off of corticosteroids. And then over the course of several months, uh, uh, we normally, uh, let's say six months, uh, we can taper off the uh, Avastin um, and uh, the reaction has settled down and, and the tumor has, uh, uh, has died. But in the worst case scenario, for patients who have persistent enlargement of a tumor, um, then in those patients, a resection on a delayed basis may be needed, but this has really been needed in a relatively few number of patients. So we believe that uh, at the present time, radiosurgery is often the first line option in most patients. It controls the treated disease in the 80 to 90% of patients, it preserves cognitive function, it can be used again as a salvage if there's new METs that develop and then a patient who's got a good functional uh, status. Remember, it's not the total number of tumors that matters, it's the total cumulative volume of tumors, as well as the 12 gray volume that includes the tumor in the brain surrounding it that's uh, going to be dosed. Um, and if you are going to resect this patient, don't forget uh, to do whole brain, uh, not, I mean, not whole brain, but do tumor bed radius surgery to the tumor bed. We often do it on the same hospital admission. Um, sometimes that's the gateway that patient comes. The patient comes in, has a resection by one of our associates, um, and then we do a, a tumor bed radius surgery uh, to reduce the risk of delayed uh, recurrence as well as uh, a carcinoma meningitis. The number of tumors is not important. What's important is the status uh, neurologically of the patient and the systemic disease. Um, the tumor volume uh, um, has been established and outcomes uh, very similar uh, to what we see in patients with uh, acoustics, or arteriovenous malformations, and, and meningiomas. It's tumor volume and location that, that are, are most important. And published studies simply just don't show a correlation between the outcome and the tumor numbers. There are a few patients with larger tumors in which more than one session may be needed. In that case, two procedures may be uh, beneficial. Radiosurgery is not a competition to what we do. 
it is addition to what we can do for patients with metastatic brain tumors. Again, one of the most obvious things we see, most common things we see in our, in our practice. It can augment or replace the role of resection in some patients, because many are best treated with radiosurgery, including some before the craniotomy, followed by the craniotomy. Prolonged survivals are now possible across the board in, in, uh, in cancer, and we need to be part of the prolonged quality of survival uh, um, in, of, our, uh, of our patients. Uh, target margin doses do not need to be in the kinds of doses that were originally recognized or thought to be needed 25 years ago. Tumor controlling doses are usually in the 16 to 20 gray, but actually one of the most important predictors may be the present volume of each tumor that receives at least 20 gray. Our trainees need to know and learn radiosurgery, just like they need to know and learn craniotomy. So there are challenges that remain uh, for uh, radiosurgery. Uh, what's too big? Uh, who will uh, need the resection? Um, how do we train our residents to do this? And remember the goal of what we want to accomplish is to kill the tumor, but not the brain. We want to save the brain and these uh, patients. Um, you are an online uh, learning program. Um, we also do tra training courses for gamma knife radio surgery. And for the first time, we're going to switch to an online venue uh, in the month of uh, July. And I'll also remind you of uh, the International Radio Surgery Research Foundation meeting originally scheduled for Newark and now moved online as well and helped to be sponsored by the uh, International Stereotech and Radio Surgery Society as a collaborative venture, which will be held online June 18th through 20th of, uh, of next month. Thank you very much for listening to me in this talk about uh, on the management of metastatic cancer that spread to uh, the brain. Thank you very much, Dr. Lunsford, for such a wonderful lecture. I am sure all the audience has learned a lot from your experience. And thank you uh, for sharing new online opportunities to learn um, in the following months. Mm, right now we have a few questions from the public that I'm going to read to you, sir. So Gibran Tariq asks, what is the maximum diameter or volume of metastatic disease that can be treated with radiosurgery? Is this, is it the same as with other lesions? For example, three centimeters? Um, yes, um, I understand the question, but the answer, it is not the same. Uh, first of all, um, the original concept of radiosurgery being limited to three centimeters, uh, which somehow emerged um, as the three centimeter rule, is completely wrong and has been wrong from the very beginning. Um, as I've shown you, I've uh, showed several patients with tumors in the nine to 12 cc uh, range. These are tumors that may be 42 millimeters uh, in the average diameter. In fact, today I just treated two. Um, and so again, the, the answer is not the number. It's uh, important as to what the cumulative volume is. Of course, as we always think about the patient, we have to think about the pros and cons of what the options are, what is the location of the tumor, what's the risk to the patient, and what's the outcome we can expect. But as a general concept for all of radiosurgery, we need to forget the three centimeter rule. It is not accurate. Okay, sir. Um, Nikad Ahmad asks, sir, if multiple brain tumors with no non-primary lesion and asymptomatic, what do you recommend further? Um, so occasionally we do see a patient who uh, presents with some neurologic uh, problem, has an MRI scan, shows multiple lesions, and we do a diligent search that is usually chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, CT scan, and we can't find a suspected source. I would say more commonly we find a suspected source, number one being in the lung. Um, and if we do see something that can be biopsied in the lung, then we do that. If not, then we would biopsy the largest lesion in the brain that's in a location that is the safest to be able to, to uh, biopsy. Uh, in, we can do, uh, in some patients, stereotactic biopsy. And 
we, we don't want to make the pathologist too nervous because they always like to have lots of time and pictures. But if we simply tell the pathologist, all I want to know is, is this cancer or not? And they say, okay, it's cancer. Then, okay, so we can go on with radiosurgery with that information. Um, and uh, we don't need to wait a long period of time for molecular stains to come back and things like that. The pathologist can work on the patient's sick. We need to treat them. We need to move this uh, along. So in our system, because we have intraoperative uh, imaging and uh, we can do the procedure followed by the gamma knife uh, on the same day, that's what we would do in uh, some patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, Brahim Kamun asks, how do you confirm that a tumor is a metastasis without histology? Do you perform radiosurgery only on clinical slash radiologic suspicion, even if the patient has no known neoplasm? Uh, the answer is, in general, no, because we need to have some prognostic information from understanding uh, the uh, source of the tumor, especially in today's world where specific targeted treatment. Um, in that situation, I would say if the chest, abdomen, and pelvis scan shows nothing, I would still bet on melanoma as being uh, the, uh, number one. And nowadays with susceptibility weighted imaging, we can often see findings on the MRI scan that are supportive of a diagnosis of melanoma. However, again, to be able to treat this patient uh, for systemic disease, uh, we will need to know something about uh, the BRAF uh, aspects and things of a tumor that's even a melanoma. If it's lung cancer, obviously different. Uh, so we'll do a stereotactic biopsy of that, uh, of that uh, patient. Uh, we don't want to empirically treat a patient without any knowledge. On the other hand, more common situation is the patient has a known primary, kidney or lung or breast. And um, we do stereotactic radiosurgery up front. We don't re-biopsy the patient's brain uh, to confirm that this is uh, um, um, related to the uh, primary tumor. Okay, sir. Um, there's another question from Chirac who's, who's asking, hello, sir, what is your take on adjuvant tumor bed stereotactic radiosurgery for glioblastomas? Um, so glioblastomas, of course, represent an enormous challenge um, for all of us uh, in the management. And the hope was that some of the new molecular knowledge uh, will help. Um, I think it's most of what we are seeing in the molecular knowledge of glioma has been helpful for prognosis prediction, not necessarily for treatment intervention. Um, but our approach in the management of glioblastoma um, and the role of radiosurgery is it's used as an adjuvant or salvage after completion of what we believe is the usual standard of care. So uh, the standard of care for most patients with glioma is um, um, surgical removal, maximal safe resection, followed by conventional fractionated radiation therapy, usually uh, in the dose of 50 to 54 gray at 1.8 gray per fraction, um, usually coupled with temozolomide uh, um, treatment, the so-called STOOP uh, regimen. However, let's say at six months, or a year, now there's been new progression of the glioblastoma, um, sometimes rebiopsy, uh, but sometimes treated empirically for this new uh, uh, tumor progression. And then we'll add radiosurgery at that time. Okay, sir. Um, under which circumstances, Dr. Jorge, Jorge Torres is asking, under which circumstances would you prefer surgery before stereotactic radiosurgery? Um, I think it depends on how sick the patient is, but I would, re I would remind our trainees, our residents, that look, even a patient with a large uh, tumor who's awake and alert will often be uh, uh, temporarily taken care of by high-dose corticosteroids inter intravenously, so that may not warrant an urgent craniotomy. Um, but if this is a larger a tumor, and if this patient has got a tumor located in an area of the brain where surgical resection has a relatively low risk, um, so for example, it's not going to be possible in a patient with a tumor in the, in the midbrain or the thalamus, 
but let's see cerebellar hemisphere, frontal lobe, uh, occipital temporal lobe. Um, if it were feasible uh, um, to wait uh, and do radius surgery first and then uh, the next day um, do uh, um, uh, surgical removal by craniotomy, that would be fine. But if that's not possible and the patient has uh, upfront craniotomy, um, we do uh, tumor bed radius surgery often the next day on the same hospital admission. Uh, and that way, uh, the subsequent treatment of this patient's systemic cancer does not get delayed by, let's say, waiting 10 days to the wound is healed and then doing 10 days of fractionated radiation uh, therapy. Um, the dose fall off of radius surgery is so sharp that we can deliver radius surgery the, to the tumor bed the, the next day um, after uh, um, the uh, craniotomy and the patient uh, goes home another day later and resumes or starts their systemic treatment as soon as possible. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a question that follows the, the recent one. Thanks uh, for the excellent presentation. What are the risk of wound infection, risk of worsening brain swelling immediately postoperatively? Um, so, um, in, in patients uh, who have had surgical resection um, and you're doing tumor bed radius surgery early, the dose to the scalp um, is so low um, in these patients by the nature of how we deliver it, at least within the gamma knife, that we don't see a risk of those patients developing uh, wound infection any greater than the risk would be from the craniotomy that they've had uh, to begin with. Um, so we think that risk is, uh, is very low. Um, we do, in planning patients whose tumors are very superficial, um, and sometimes they're larger tumors, uh, um, these patients may have uh, significant medical risk factors, so coronary artery disease, uh, patients, uh, as so many are, especially older patients, are on uh, aspirin antiplatelet agents uh, um, or other uh, Plavix, things like that. Uh, those patients, we ha would have to wait to get them off those uh, agents, and there may be other reasons why there would be a risk for them. So we would prefer radius surgery in those patients. We don't worry about the prothrombin time, the PTT. We don't worry about the INR. We treat patients who are on full anticoagulation but with radius surgery, whereas you would be extremely reluctant to do that and do a craniotomy on, the, on, the, on such patients. So I, I think that the evidence is very strong, uh, but each patient needs to be thought of uh, in, in individually. And it, when I tell trainees, uh, it, when you're trying to make a decision, remember you're the doctor, you have to recommend something to the patient. You can't just tell the patient, look, these are the five things you can do, what do you want to do? You have to, you have to Ask, you have to. You're the expert. You have to make a recommendation to the uh, to, to the to the patient. I tell them give them the mother test. So, if this is your mother, what would you want done? Okay. Um, and if uh, it survives that question, uh, then maybe you need to do surgery. Uh, but if you have doubts that you think your mother would have to have this operation, then maybe your patient shouldn't not have it either. Okay, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ahmed asks, what is the limit of cumulative volume for radiosurgery? I don't know that we know for sure the uh, total volume. I showed a, a case in which the uh, total volume, uh, uh, 12 gray and tumor volume was 27 uh, cc's. And in the article that we just published in the Journal of Neurosurgery uh, this month uh, with Bowden as the first author, uh, looking at patients with 15 or more METs, the average number of uh, METs was 22 or 23. Uh, um, again, the, the whole brain dose delivered in treating all the patient tumors in a single day was less than three gray. That's less than what the brain gets in a single day of a whole brain radiation therapy plan using 30 gray at, uh, uh, maximum dose delivered over 10 days. So those patients are gonna get three gray 10 days in a row. Uh, we give the patient three gray in a, in a, a single day and then that's it. 
Um, and those patients, as we said, have a very low risk of developing leukoencephalopathy. Those patients don't get the white matter wipeout that patients who live a year um, with a, um, a brain mat after whole brain radiation therapy that we'll see in 90% of the patients. Uh, so there is no absolute limits. Like everything else we do, it's a balance uh, between what are the options, what are the uh, risks. Um, and the main important thing in terms of survival, as we now we, we know, um, in 80% of the time, more than that uh, in some studies, um, the patient's now going to die of progression of systemic disease. We, we as surgeons uh, can't fix that. Uh, obviously, our con oncology uh, colleagues will be working on that. That was compared to 20 years ago when probably 80% of patients with uh, cancer in the brain died of progression of the brain disease. And those patients were all getting whole brain radiation therapy at the time. So we flipped this and we're now part of the reason that patients should uh, survive longer, but also survive at a higher quality of life and whose brains continue to work. Okay, sir, thank you. Before we go on for a couple more minutes for questions uh, from the public, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and tell the people that they can join Dr. Gardner's presentation called Refining the Role of Endoscopic Endonasal Surgery, When is the Standard of Care? Uh, we just uh, sent the link on the chat. So if you wish, you can you can go ahead and go to that other and room. And they should do that. Dr. Gardner is outstanding. <laughs> okay, sir. Um, there is uh, there are some other questions that we have, and we, we might want to answer all of them, but we are not going to be able to do it. Um, are there specific tumor types that you feel respond better to radio surgery? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number one is uh, non-small cell lung cancer, which actually is number one in terms of uh, patient volume. Um, uh, second is breast um, in terms of likelihood of significant shrinkage. Um, after that, thyroid is very uh, responsive uh, to this. Uh, small cell lung cancer is very responsive with a very high chance of uh, tumor regression, but a much higher chance that there's going to be a new tumor development over the first six months. Probably 30 to 50% of patients will need retreatment uh, but for new disease in, in small cell uh, lung cancer. Uh, some of the tumors that are especially GI origin, renal cell, and melanoma are perhaps, uh, um, I'm not sure if radio resistant is uh, the best term. Uh, but we certainly tend to use higher doses in those patients uh, because of the uh, uh, a little bit less likelihood that the tumor will shrink. Okay, I think that uh, that answered uh, answered a lot of questions from the public. Um, sir, do you have a uh, decision map for posterior false metastasis in between deciding? Uh, radiosurgery or craniotomy? Well, it certainly depends on, first of all, neurological status of the patient. If this patient's awake and alert uh, and uh, steroids are working fine, uh, this patient may not need to have uh, a rush into a, a surgical decompression. If the patient has no known diagnosis with a cerebellar brain metastasis, uh, maybe they should have upfront radiosurgery followed by um, uh, surgical removal. Uh, and that's in part because, as we said, the, the risk of uh, carcinomatous meningitis may be uh, um, seven to eight times higher in the patients who have uh, a surgical resection first, even with the tumor bed radiosurgery. So we can significantly reduce that risk with upfront radiosurgery. Um, I would say that severe headache and severe imbalance or ataxia are concerns which would lead me in many patients to push more towards uh, surgical removal of, uh, of that tumor early on. Okay, sir, thank you. Um, I can see here. What's, it, what's your experience, sir, about frame or frameless mask radiosurgery? 
and how do you adjust those in fractionated radius surgery? Uh, well, it's two good questions. Uh, one is that in the technology that I use, um, a mask is used uh, in uh, less than 15% uh, of patients um, uh, because the features that we look at are number of brain metastasis, this length of time to deliver the radiation, age of the patient, cognitive uh, status, and uh, finally, uh, mask-based treatment is uh, for some patients more claustrophobic uh, than frame-based treatment because frame-based patients, we give conscious sedation uh, with uh, midazolam and fentanyl intravenously, which is uh, most patients find that quite uh, fine. In fact, a patient I treated today, who had, we did a mask on today, but the first treatment, multiple tumors, uh, uh, she said today, please do the frame again. I like it much better than the, uh, than the uh, mask. Uh, our, most of our treatments are, to answer question two, are designed to treat uh, patients in a single wheels in to wheels out uh, treatment paradigm like we do surgery. Um, and there aren't so many that we do multiple treatments on, but those typically represent some of the cases that I showed with much larger tumors in which a repeat treatment uh, uh, may result in faster shrinkage or more complete shrinkage of the, uh, of the uh, tumor. So um, we rarely do uh, more than uh, two uh, um, uh, fractions. Okay, sir. Well, uh, we still want to ask you a lot of questions, but well, we got to get the program going. Of and uh, on behalf of Cien, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Lunsford, for your participation. This has been a wonderful lecture. You've, we've had a great experience. We're really grateful and honored for your participation at 2020 IWBNC. Uh, more than 450 people were connected through Zoom during your lecture uh, from over 80 countries. And uh, I hope I will uh, have a good experience uh, like everyone did. And uh, you're more than welcome to stay tuned for, to watch any other conferences, uh, like I said, and you reminded Dr. Gardner's presentation has just started and so people can join that. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. Take care.